They say that this had occurred because there were there were no proper resources at that time to help this detective figure anything out. Hi guys, it's me Keisha Jackson. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for clicking on my video. I truly appreciate it. And guess what? It's True Crime Tuesdays. Dan, if you're watching, please rate my singing 1 to 100 or more. I skipped last week Tuesday and not. Well, my three fans weren't very happy with me. I do apologize. I've been really busy lately because um, Wim Cyril lifted us to level 1. Matric farewells are in full swing, so if you're doing one this year, leave me a comment down below and I'll do your makeup. So I was really busy with matric farewells and I left my makeup at my salon and I forgot to bring it back with me. So I missed Trick and Tuesday last week. But it's cool. I'm here now. Last week we spoke about Cedric. Last week, the week before. We spoke about Cedric and why are people like this? Can someone please explain it to me? I don't enjoy it, but I, I enjoy like telling you guys about it. Before I get into this video, I do want to put out a very huge disclaimer. Uh, the scenes I will be talking about in this video are very graphic. It involves acts of violence against children and um, sexual assault as well as just bad stuff. If you are sensitive, please give this one a skip. If not, welcome. Please don't forget to give me a thumbs up and also hit that subscribe button because it helps. Let's get into it this week on True Grand Tuesdays. I am going to be talking about Norman Simmons. Have you heard of him? Norman Simmons was born on the 12th of January 1967 in Cape Town, South Africa. Guys, have you noticed that like most of these serial killers are coming from Cape Town? There wasn't much on Norman's background. It was reported that he was raised by a single mom up until he was a toddler and then when he was a toddler he moved to the Eastern Cape to be raised by his grandparents and this is where he was raised in traditional in a traditional Corsa household. Um, he returned to Cape Town in the teenage years of his life to move back in with his mother, her new husband and his older brother. Norman's friends reported that he was highly intelligent. Um, he was a very well-dressed, bilingual, very approachable, likable. He spoke several different languages. He spoke Afrikaans, English, Corsa, and I think it was Zulu. I'm not too sure about that. Norman's friends also reported that um, they had thought he had homosexual tendencies. Norman was educated and he had gotten a teaching job at a boys only school in Claremont, I think it was. And that's where he would, how he would make a living. 3rd of October 1986, a body of a 14-year-old boy was discovered in the Modder Dam railway station fields and he would later be identified as Jonathan. I don't want to give any surnames out because I just want to respect the families that are still alive who had gone through these terrible things. So Jonathan's body was found. Um, it was found face down with his head pushed into the sand 
he was also sodomized and his hands were tied behind his back. The police determined his cause of death to be strangulation. In that same area of the Modern Railway Station, eight more victims would later be found. They would also be molested and tied up and the cause of death would be strangulation. I'm going to list these boys and their ages because I just want to give you a clear indication of what was happening at the time. I also just want to put in there that these murders happened before the 90s hit. The victims were Mario, who was 13 years old, Yusuf, 10 years old, Freddy, 12 years old, Calvin, 9 years old, Denver, 11 years old, and Samuel, who was 15 years old. The other two victims could not be identified because of the state that their bodies were found in. Um, once the Mitchell's Plain community had caught wind of these terrifying crimes, they had obviously been outraged and they were very um, vocal about what they think the police force and law enforcement should do. This led to a investigative, investigative detective being put on the case. The detective they had hired to investigate these murders were... He was just underqualified had no training in um, investigating serial killers. There was just no hope. He would later retire to have made absolutely no headway in these cases. They say that this had occurred because there were, there were no proper resources at that time to help this detective figure anything out. Two years go by. And it's like absolute radio silence. Nothing is happening. Nothing is getting done about these murders. Everyone is just like, ah, da, 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 you know how it is, yeah. After two, after the two years of silence, on the twenty seventh of October, nineteen ninety two, eleven year old Jacobus was found in Nandi Beach, sodomized tied up and strangled. 13th of January 1994, an unidentified child was found in the exact same way in the Valtafreda Dunes. Guys, the person, we both know who it is, who is committing these crimes has now moved their hunting grounds, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, from railway stations and fields to dunes. The 20th of January, seven days after the unidentified boy was found, Elneo, El Eleno, Eleno, please forgive me, guys. Um, the body was found also in the dunes. And then five days later, a 10-year-old boy's body was found by the name of Donovan. The thing about Donovan is his mom knew he was missing and she hadn't reported it for 48 hours because she was looking for Donovan herself. Her reason being was that she had no faith in the justice system because of the political climate of South Africa at that time and she knew that her child's case wouldn't be taken seriously. The 25th of January 1994, the same day Donovan's body was found, another boy's body was found just 20 meters away from Donovan by the name of Jeremy. Jeremy was 12. Yes, the thing about Jeremy, guys. Jeremy's family didn't know he was missing until a week after he went missing. Now, the the articles and the research that I did and everything that I read 
People say that this was normal back in the day because a lot of children in the Mitchell's Plain area would travel from family member to family member and they didn't have access. There was no wide access to technology to just WhatsApp someone and be like, I'm here safe. This finding of these two boys on the same day outraged the community even more than before. They were like, fucking done now. They're like, I'm done. I demand for these cases to be taken seriously. I demand for SAPs to do something about it because our kids can't just keep going missing and they can't just keep turning up dead. I agree with that. A week after Jeremy and Donovan's bodies were found, the police, members of the South African Army and community members went on an organized search in the Valta Frieda area. They happened to stumble upon eight more victims. I can't name all these victims. They didn't release names of all these victims. So there were eight more young boys found in the dunes where Jeremy and Donovan were found, as well as that poor little unidentified boy. Following this search, over the weekend, a 14-man special task team was established in February of 1994, later known as the Station Strangler Squad. The Station Strangler Squad, say that seven times fast, was headed by Lieutenant Yuhan Kutsa. Sounds familiar, doesn't he? This task team were given all the resources necessary, such as computers, data capturing assistance, and even a forensic psychologist team. They were stationed in the Mitchell's Plain area, and they were open to public tip-offs. So if you were a civilian and you would see something happening in the Mitchell's Plain area that was suspicious, that could be maybe linked to one of these murders, these are the people you would go to. Every single tip given to the Station Strangler Squad was investigated thoroughly. This meant that they had interrogated over 2,000 suspects in three months. Some of these tips that they were given weren't even serious and they were just wasting the time. On a side note, this was during the 1994 for presidential election and unfortunately this case was used for campaigns and votes which is actually disgusting because no suspects had been arrested or been put into custody it outraged the community even more and violent protests broke down to the point that a police station in Stienberg was almost burned to the ground after this had happened, the forensic psychologist team, by the way, who was headed by a woman by the name of Mickey Pistorius, yes, this was crazy because back in the day, that sort of profession was headed mostly by males. So, the forensic psychology team requested the help from renowned American criminal profiler by the name of Robert Ressler. Mr. Ressler was going to fly out to South Africa, but the decision was changed because of the political climate that South Africa was in at the moment and the buzz regarding the case, they were afraid for his safety. He did um, advise them from afar from a distance. So the forensic team, like I said before, was headed by a woman named Mickey Pistorius. She decided to draw up her own criminal profile and then send it to Mr. Ressler, who would give her some advice on it and so forth. And he had reviewed it and he said that it is really good. It is 98% similar to what he drew up himself. 
for the first time in South Africa, South Africa's law enforcement history, this criminal profile would be released to the public. The profile that was released stated the following information. Listen carefully, guys. The perpetrator is between the ages of 25 and 30 years old. He is a single male, most likely to be in a position of authority, such as a teacher, police officer, social worker, or preacher. He is also known to be highly intelligent, a bilingual, well-dressed, and possibly living with his parents. And then at the bottom, it stated that he was also having homosexual tendencies. The squad putting this out was purely to stop him in his tracks, you know, catch him quicker. It didn't happen because a young boy by the name of Alway was found murdered, molested and tied up in March of 1994. Now this is where it gets juicy, not that it hasn't been juicy this whole time, but the station strangler made a mistake this time, well I won't say a mistake, a good mistake for, for the law enforcement, and there was an eyewitness the lady came forward, it was a woman, and she stated that Alroy was spotted with a man that had a dark complexion, an afro-like hairstyle, and a scar on his right cheek. An identikit was released alongside of the criminal profile. This speeded up the process of the station strangler being caught. 12th of April 1994, a month after Alroy's body was found, a nurse in a psychiatric clinic had called in to the station strangler squad headquarters and she had said that there is a man here that matches the identikit. He is a patient at the clinic. So... Lieutenant Yuhan Kutsa is like, let's get it, you know, just like babe with alts, whatever. He was like, yo, yo, we're going to go catch this guy. Lego. After the phone call, Norman Simons, did I say Simmons this whole time? Whatever. Norman was brought in for questioning. He didn't answer any of the questions and he um, offered to write the police a story about his life. So he wrote down everything. I couldn't find the actual note because obviously. On the 13th of April 1994, Norman was arrested in connection with the Mitchell's Payne murders. He could not be charged with Alroy's murder yet because there wasn't sufficient evidence against him. At that time, they hadn't built the case up enough in order for him to be charged. He was later released that afternoon because of insufficient evidence uh, tying him to the Mitchell's plane murders, just to be arrested again on the same day for Alroy's murder. Norman is sitting with Lieutenant Kutzer, and Lieutenant Kutzer is questioning him. Norman confesses. In his confession, he states, I have been, quote, 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 I have been murdering boys since 1986. He also says to um, Lieutenant Kutzer that he will go and show him where he had, quote again, dumped, end quote, the bodies. So Kutzer is like, okay, you can show me, but I first want to, f- we were going to get done with this before we leave. Norman had said that in his confession he wrote, and I want to read it because I want to get it exactly correct. Quote, I am dirty, I am filthy, and I am not worthy. I am sorry for letting you down. Don't get caught in the same thing. I really regret everything, and it's hard to be possessed by unknown forces. These forces cannot be explained by medication. 
I salute you with love for a better and understanding and more peaceful South Africa. End quote. I feel like at this point, Norman is smart enough, he's intelligent to know that if he goes on an insanity plea, he'd more than likely be put into a mental facility rather than a maximum security prison. Lieutenant could say is like, okay, I'm going to give you a psych evaluation. I'm going to get someone to give you a psych evaluation. It was also reported by um, Norman's attorney that whilst Norman was receiving his psych evaluation, he was still being interrogated by the station strangler squad, which is not allowed. After his psych evaluation, they had obviously still had to come to a conclusion of that. Lieutenant Kutzer arranged for a completely biased police officer to take Norman to where he said the rest of these bodies were dumped. This was done because it, Lieutenant Kutzer didn't want to give any room for a defense attorney to state that the squad or the law enforcement had swayed Norman in a certain direction because of his mental state at that moment. Norman travels to Mitchell's plane in the early hours of the morning because the squad didn't want the community to catch wind that they had a suspect in custody. This would obviously lead to township justice. If you guys have never heard of township justice, don't Google it. I don't know if I can say township justice. I know it as township justice. It's not a, by any means, a racial thing. It is just when the community takes the law into their own hands. Without the police officer knowing where any of these bodies were located by the station squad, Norman had pointed him out at all the points where the bodies were found. and. He then said to the person accompanying him that he's going to point him out now to a body that they haven't yet found. When Norman points the police officer in the direction of the body that wasn't found, no body was there, but there were children's clothes. Now, the explanation that there was no body there by the lieutenant was that there are wild dogs in the area. In Norman's written confession, he stated that he had been killing young boys since 1986 for various reasons. Two reasons. First reason being that when he was in the Eastern Cape as a young child, uh, he was cursed by an elderly woman. Second reason being, which um, investigators and the forensic psychology team had determined to be the more plausible reason, is that... um, Simon had confessed and reported that his elder brother had been sodomizing him. He had sodomized him throughout his teenage life and he would hear the voice of his elder brother in his head and this is what drove him to kill. I know in some cases people that are abused usually abuse and it's not, please don't get me wrong, It's not the answer and it's not the way to do things. But this gave the forensic team more of a clear path as to why a very intelligent, highly educated man was doing these things to young boys. The results for Norman's psych evaluation came back. And it had stated that Norman isn't suffering from any severe mental illness such as schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder. He is suffering from several different multiple personalities and depression, but not any mental illness that can seriously take over the control of your mind to make you think you see things and doing things that aren't there. The 27th of February, 1995, Norman's trial began. Presiding was Judge W.A. van der de Finta. Prosecutor for the state was Mark Stowe, who would later reveal during Norman's um, interrogation, when Norman's brother's name was mentioned, his 
demeanor would physically change. He would become, he would just become uneasy. He would growl like a like an animal, and then he would start to speak in ton- tongues, and this swayed people to think that he was suffering from a mental illness or severe PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome, something heavier than depression. Due to advanced decomposition and DNA being broken down so severely, and also it's the 1990s, there aren't there isn't advanced technology for DNA and testing and all that. Norman, unfortunately, couldn't be tied to any of the Mitchell's plane murders that he had already confessed to. He did get charged with Alloy's murder on the 15th of June, 1995. Norman Simons was sentenced to 25 years for a murder charge and 10 years for kidnapping. 35 years. He got sentenced to serve at the Drakenstein Correctional Facility. That's where he's currently serving his sentence. It is reported that Norman is a model inmate and he often mentors new convicted people. He's just found a whole new path, you know. He's he's changed. Of course, the community was, was very pleased that... The killer has been put behind bars and they can breathe and everything is okay. Norman's defense attorney, though, he was, like, not happy. He's just saying, I'm not going to rest because I believe my client's innocent. And he was forced into a confession because they were interrogating him. And in 2005, they reopened the case for investigation. Because DNA testing had become uh, advanced... Everything was tested again. And the semen, I'm sorry, it's going to get heavy, guys. The semen found inside the bodies and on the clothes of the children did not match Norman. Uh, The eyewitness that placed him at Elroy's murder also was misinformed of times. The defense attorney... uh, Proceeded to do an inquest. The inquest was filed. And um, Norman's parole was denied. They didn't have a good enough case built up against the state. So unfortunately, his inquest was denied. I don't know why I said unfortunately. Norman was sentenced in 1995 to 35 years. I don't know if he is eligible for parole in 2030 or 2030 could be his release date. But I send my deepest condolences to the family members of those young boys. They did not deserve that. Their lives did, didn't deserve to end that way at that time. And I feel like no one gives a human the right to take someone else's life away. Especially not a child. I was skeptical of doing this story because I think I mentioned before that I don't like I don't like speaking about kids getting hurt. But we we are having a serious problem around the world right now and child trafficking is horrific. I just want young girls and parents to be more vigilant young ladies like just be more with it if you know what I mean things can happen very easily but anyway guys please don't forget to leave me a thumbs up subscribe please and also comment I want to I want to have a conversation back and forth of what you guys want to see next, who you think I should look into, um, what are your thoughts on this case, do you think that Norman could possibly be paroled or released in the next 10 years, 
I just want to say thank you to every single person that tunes into my videos most Tuesdays. And I'll be back next week, Tuesday, for another Chicken Tuesday. Please stay safe, wear your mask, social distance, sanitize your hands. Please see you guys next week.